In the next couple of videos we are going to take a look at how to build a Corinthian column like the one you see here, step by step and non-destructively. So let's get into it. To start let me show you the references that I've gathered for this project and by the way you can find all of them on my Pinterest account. So first of all this is what we'll try to emulate and this first reference here which is intended to be used from the front will be pretty useful when trying to replicate this concept of the elevation on the diagonal. We will start by building the base pieces that you see right here, so the base column, this inner piece and the top of the column, and then of course we will add all the different elements that we need in order to close the composition. To help in the process, I placed an additional reference to be used from the front, which will be instead useful when trying to assess the correct proportions between the different items of our capital. Lastly, I took my first reference, rotated it and placed it so that I can use it from the top. And this will be used to check whether the proportions between our column and the top of the capital are correct. We can proceed by building the base column. And these columns here have a particular feature in that they are fluted columns, where flutes are nothing else than these little grooves that you can see right here. Now, Corinthian column typically has 20 to 24 flutes, and my reference in particular has 24. So to model it, I'm going to shift A and add a cylinder, and I'm going to bring the number of vertices down from 32 to 24. We can now tap into edit mode and into x-rays mode as well. And we need to resize our mesh in order to match our reference. And we will need as well to rotate it a bit in order for our faces to be pointing the right direction. I will then come out of the x-rays mode, select the top and bottom faces and remove them. I'm as well going to shade smooth the mesh. And at this point I can select everything and press I to inset and then I again to inset individual faces, leaving just a little gap between each active selection. And with this selection still active from the top, I'm going to hit Alt E to extrude along the normals. And then I'm going to change my gizmo to normal and my pivot point to individual origins. And this will allow me to scale each selected face along its own x-axis. I will then switch the gizmo back to global and scale a bit the selected faces also on the z-axis. At this point all we need is to add a subdivision surface modifier and usually three levels of subdivisions will do. And we can run an edge loop right in the middle and hit Ctrl B to bevel in order to have the same distance from the top of our column to the first edge loop and from the bottom to our second edge loop. We can finally select the different edge loops surrounding each flute and crease them all the way up to one in order to sharpen their look. Another thing I like to do here is to add an additional edge loop at the top and also at the bottom of course, in order to redefine the shapes of the flutes. Then I will also add an edge loop right in the middle and this will help us in redefining the scale of the column because at a certain point, of course, we will need to make this taller, so you may be tempted to just scale it on the z-axis, but as you can see, this is going to destroy the proportions that we built so far. So what we can do instead is go into X-rays mode and into face select mode, and with B, we can select the lower half and just push it down in order to redefine how tall the column is without losing any of the proportions that we built. I'm going to leave this as it is right now and we will take a deeper look at it at a later stage. So let's now model the top of the column and to do so I'm going to enable one of my frontal references and actually this one here. And all we need to do is to tap into edit mode and enable x-rays. Then select the top edge loop and proceed to extrude up and scale up and also run an edge loop if needed scale down and bevel to make the curvature a little bit smoother select again the top edge loop e to extrude let's scale it up a bit and then extrude it up and every time you need to make an edge loop look sharper you can just select it and then hit shift e and increase it all the way up to one and then going to select again the top edge loop then e to extrude Let's scale it up a bit, extrude up, again E to extrude and right click to cancel and let's scale this down, run an edge loop right in the middle and scale it up. 
you can then of course play around with how you place your edge loops in order to change the look of the column and finalize it and also take a look at the edges you creased and see if there is anything else you want to crease like this edge loop here at the bottom and as you can see here we have something a bit harsh to look at in terms of shading so probably we can remove this edge loop here select this at the middle and double press G in order to slide it a bit in the center and yes I think that would be it for the for the column to model the top of the capital I'm simply going to add a cube and scale it down on the z-axis and move it up a bit and then I will add two edge loops in order to form this kind of cross right here and then again from the top in x-rays and in edit mode I'm going to scale it up right where I would say these points here on our reference are touching the sides of our cube which is no more a cube by the way we can then select the edges of the corners of our mesh and then again from the top with x-rays on we simply need to hit ctrl b and bevel them according to our reference i will then select these edge loops that we added previously and i'm going to scale them down but not on the z-axis i'm going to press s and shift z scale them down a bit and then again bevel and this time we'll probably need an extra edge loop Okay, and this is fine. I will then come out of the X-rays mode, select one of the faces at the top, and then go to select, select similar normal, X and delete faces, and I'm going to do the same here at the bottom. I will then select the top edge loop and press F to add a single face. Select this bottom edge loop, I'm going to bring it up a bit, and then again from the top, in x-rays mode I'm going to scale it down and finally I need to select these shorter edges here at the corners and again from the top I'm simply going to scale them down to approximately match the reference switching to the frontal view I'm going to enable this other reference here and as you can see as switching among references trying to use them to my own advantage and not as cages I cannot escape. When you're happy with the result that you have, you can simply shade smooth. And here we will need, of course, a subdivision surface modifier and also a bevel modifier to be placed on top and I'm going to change the uh, limit metal to weight bring down the amount a bit and increase the number of segments to two and now I'm going to manually select the edges I want this bevel to be applied to and bring from the side panel the weight all the way up to one To model the inner piece, I'm going to use a cylinder again with 24 vertices, uh, remove the top and bottom faces, select everything, scale down, move everything up, trying to match the other pieces of the column. I will then select this uh, top edge loop and bring it all the way up until it meets the top of the capital. I will then shade smooth, add an edge loop in the middle and slide it up a bit and I will then select this top face loop and extrude along the normals and again we will need to use a subdivision surface modifier with a bevel modifier placed on top I will set it again on weight, decrease the amount, increase the number of segments and manually select the edge loops that I want to look sharper and by the way, this is not the final shape of this piece right here. And the reason why is that once we will have all the different decorations that we need in order to complete the composition, this piece here will be a bit wider at the top 
and it will also be a bit curved in order to follow the curvature of all the different ornaments that we're going to add. But for the time being, I'm going to leave it as it is, and we will take a deeper look at it at a later stage. It is time to introduce our main guest, which is the Acanthus leaf, and this may seem intimidating, but especially if you're into classical reconstructions, you need to find a way to get comfortable around these kind of shapes, since they are literally everywhere in classical compositions. We can start by breaking down the shape into smaller components, and what we can notice is that the shape is symmetric around the center. Then we would have groups of leaves on each side, and you would typically notice two to three to four groups, and then again a group at the center, where each single group is in turn composed of four to five single leaves. And what we need to pay attention to in particular are the connections between each group, since these parts here are the ones that will give the major contribution in defining the three-dimensional shape of our mesh, along of course with the outlines of each single leaf. This top section here is the one that will be bent in order to give to the leaf its classical appearance, and in particular I'm going to model a leaf with four groups of five single leaves in order to mimic the reference that you see right here. To model the leaf I'm going to use this reference that you see right here, again to be used from the front, and actually I'm just going to model one single group and I will then reuse it in order to model all the other groups. We will build this as a flat surface at first and only after that we will build its two-dimensional shape progressively in a non-destructive way. To start modeling I will usually add a plane right at the intersection between two single leaves within the group I'm trying to model and then I will simply add an edge loop right in the middle. This would allow me to start extruding these edges and start building the outline of the leaf. And the reason why I'm building the outline of the leaf in this way is that it will strengthen a bit the overall shape, especially when it will come to a thickness to our final mesh. When it comes to model the top of the leaf, I use this flow here. So one phase, two and three, which gives me a nice quad right at the end. And this may seem counterintuitive because it also gives us a flat top, while it should be a bit pointy. But that's not really a problem because in the end we will run an edge loop in the middle and this will allow us again to re-establish the correct shape of the leaf. Take all the time you need to get the shape right, even if it can be a painful process at times, I honestly find it quite relaxing. In any case I can assure you that it is time well spent and that it will really pay off in the end. Once you've completed the outlines of the leaves, you can simply proceed to extrude down the bottom edge loop. And remember that at any time you can zero it out on the Z axis by pressing S, Z and zero to make it even. With the first group of leaves being finalized, you can simply duplicate it and position it on the other group you want to model. And with the help of proportional editing, you can reproportion it based on the reference. Again, make sure that the space between each group, which represents the connection that we will model in a bit, is as smooth as possible. And make also sure that the edge loops of the different groups are quite aligned in order to have clean topology once these connections will be in place. With the same technique, I created the last two groups of leaves. Um, notice that at this point, the reference has served its purpose, so I'm no longer following it. It is then just a matter of adding a mirror modifier with the clipping option turned on and start connecting the different pieces of the mesh. To create the central group you can simply borrow one of the other groups, cut it in half and place it at the center so that it clips with its mirror counterpart and simply start rearranging the vertices as needed. Once done, to connect it to the rest of the mesh, the easier way would be to select this bottom edge loop and just count the number of edges. Here at the bottom it says it's 10 edges. So we can add an edge loop here at the other part of the mesh and increase the number of cuts up to 10. At this point we can select the two segments and simply hit Ctrl E and bridge edge loops. 
Okay, so now that we have our flat surface, we can start building the third dimension, and we can do that by using shape keys. Now, if you don't know what shape keys are, they're essentially a way of rearranging the vertices within your mesh in a non-destructive way, where you retain the possibility of transitioning between the different shape keys, which is good for animation, but also, as in our case, it is good if you want to build a layer-based system to keep all your deformations organized and non-destructive. As a first step, I'm going to rename my base shape keys to flat. And now what I want to do is to take the, this portion of the leaves, which are overlapping with the rest of the mesh, and I want to push them a bit on the X axis. So to do so, I will create another shape key and I'm going to call it L underscore detached. I can now tab into edit mode and select the faces that I need. And in this case, I want also to move the surrounding geometry, so I will enable uh, proportional editing. But as you can see, as I'm increasing the radius, I'm also moving the group at the top of the one I'm trying to manipulate. So I will use this useful checkbox, which is connected only, that will allow me to move simply the faces which are directly connected to the one I have selected. I will then repeat the same procedure also for the other groups and remember that if you have difficulties in selecting the face that you want you can always switch to x-rays and in this way it will be much easier to select exactly the face that you need. Once done we can use the value slider to transition between the different shape keys and we also have this range min and max, and in particular we can change the max value to something higher than 1, which means that if we need to, we can over-exaggerate the manipulation that we just did. The next step would be to take the connections between the different groups of leaves and push them a bit outward. So again I'm going to create another shape key, and I'm going to call it connections out, and then I would tab into edit mode with my uh, connection selected, disable the proportional editing, and I'm going to move it a bit on the x-axis. I will then create another shape key, and I'm going to call it center out. And as I did for the connections, this time I'm going to select the central piece of the mesh, and I'm going to bring it a bit outward. I will now do exactly the same, but this time with the outlines of each single leaf. And since they are essentially loops, I can simply Alt and Shift and left click to get them all at once. And since I want the effect to be a bit smoother as I'm moving toward the bottom, I'm going to press C to circle deselect a few of these face loops in the lower half of the mesh. You can notice that we need to move these two leaves a bit more on the x-axis, so I'm going to select the relevant shape key and the faces that I need, re-enable back proportional editing and I'm going to move them a bit more on the x-axis. To add thickness to the whole mesh, I'm going to create another shape key and call it depth. Then select everything and extrude along the normals. And I'm going as well to select this bottom face loop and delete it. Lastly, I'm going to create a final shape key layer and I'm going to call it adjustments. And you can use it to move things around. I will use it to make my leaves a bit thicker. With our shape keys in place, it is now time to think about the overall shape of our mesh. And in particular, I want to start working on the bending. So the easier way to do that is to add a simple deform modifier, set it on bend on the Y axis, and you can see that it is already bending. We can push the angle all the way up to 360. And this is starting to resemble what we need. Notice that the mesh is bending using as a pivot point its origin point. 
and this is usually fine but in this case we need to have a bit more control so i'm going to add an empty and within the modifier i'm going to select as the origin this very same empty which means that we now have full control over the pivot point of the deformation and you can already see that if we move it up a bit the top part of the mesh is right where it is supposed to be we only need to make sure that the bending is happening only at the top while we want the bottom part to be straight, which in other terms means that we want the modifier to have the most of its influence at the top, and then we want this influence to gradually start fading as we move toward the bottom, which again means that we need to define a gradient. So I'm going to create a vertex group and I'm going to call it deformation. I will then disable the uh, simple deform and subdivision modifier just for now. We can then switch to the weight paint mode and here there is this handy tool which is the gradient tool and with this selected from the top we can left click and drag and you can do it a few times and now we can switch back to the object mode and in, within the simple deform modifier under restrictions just select the newly created vertex group let's enable it again and let's enable also the subdivision surface modifier i will then increase the angle to something like 450 and now we can play with the pivot point to define even better the overall shape of our mesh now the cool thing about non-destructive workflows is that you can change things around at any time like in my case i have a bit of a harsh transition right here so I'm going to go back to the weight paint mode and I will disable again the simple deform and the subdivision modifiers. And this time I want to remove some of the weight which is right here. So I'm going to change my brush from draw to subtract. And again with the gradient tool, but this time from the bottom, I will left click and drag. And then enable again the simple deform and this is looking a bit better. As a final step to this process, I want to apply some macro deformation to my mesh. Like for instance, I want this top part to be a bit narrower and I also want to move some of the features around. But again, I want to do that non-destructively in coherence with what we have done so far. So this time we are going to use a lattice modifier. So first step would be to add a lattice, which essentially is a cage that encompasses our mesh. And we will then add control points to this cage and we will use those control points in order to control the deformation of our mesh. We can add control points here in the object properties tab of the lattice and we can play with these values right here. So I'm going to add a few loops and then I'm going to select my mesh and add a lattice modifier. And now I can simply select my lattice. And now we can start moving some of these control points around and you can see that these allow us to have a very organic deformation and even more importantly we can uh, of course enable or disable the modifier but we also have a strength slider that we can use in order to control the amount of influence of our deformation so let me reset this okay and let's start moving things around so i'm going to select like these two top loops and i'm going to compress them on the y-axis and then i'm selecting these two points right here moving them down a bit maybe select these two as well moving them on the x-axis to give it this kind of curvature right here then probably i want to select these control points right at the edges and move them a bit backward to give it a slight bend on the z-axis and then i think i'm going to move as well these two control points a bit backward on the x-axis so something like this of course you can play around and find the uh, final configuration that you prefer the most. Um, I'm going to keep it like, like this. 
Now, what we ended up with is a very flexible system where we can change things around very easily. And more importantly, we can do that non-destructively by either using our modifiers or the different shape keys that we employed. And in fact, in the end, if we were to, let's say, disable the different uh, modifiers that we applied, as well as all the different shape keys that we added, what we have simply is the flat surface that we started with at the beginning. I'm now going to bring back my column and the inner piece as well, and I'm going to move my acanthus leaf a bit on the x-axis. And of course, when I'm doing so, I'm selecting also the lattice and the empty that controls the bending through the simple deform modifier, because these three uh, pieces right here need to travel together because otherwise, if you only move the acanthus leaf, you're going to encounter these kind of troubles right here. And then switching to the front, and I'm going to uh, enable my frontal reference and the X-rays as well. And with these three pieces, again, selected together, I'm going to scale and reposition according to the reference that I have. And in particular, here, I'm looking at the height of the leaf. And of course, I also need to position it uh, on the X-axis. And you can see that maybe we need to uh, rotate it a bit. Like so. Let's check again the proportions. And this should be correctly placed. I just want to do some minor adjustments. So with my lattice selected, I'm going to select every control point and move everything down a bit. Like so. Then I'm going to also scale it a bit on the Z axis and scale it down a bit on the Y axis. And again, we can play around uh, with the different uh, systems that we built. Like I'm going to select this pivot point right here and I'm going to move it a bit. And now once I'm satisfied, I'm going to take a look at the transformations for our Ancanthus leaf because we moved everything in object mode. So our origin point is right here and this is fine but I want to apply the rotation, so I'm going to hit Ctrl A and apply rotation, and I also want to apply the scale, so Ctrl A and apply the scale. And again, time for some minor adjustments, and I could really uh, do this for hours, and this non-destructive workflow that we implemented is really helpful in achieving the final uh, shape that you want. Like, for instance, now I want this to be a bit more bent, so I'm going to do that with my simple deform modifier. And again, I'm going to tweak a bit the pivot point. Then probably I see that these connections um, are not exactly the way I want them. I want to ease them a bit so I can go back to my uh, layer connection out and reduce the value a bit and perhaps I also want these leaves to be a bit thicker. So again, I can go in my adjustments layer, tab into edit mode and do whatever adjustment I need to do. And this concludes this first part of the video where we uh, mainly focused on building the main components of the column and we heavily focused as well on non-destructive workflows in building our acanthus leaf. In the second part instead we are going to see how to model the other components such as the spirals and how to use all these elements in an instance based system in order to build the rings for the leaf and all the mirror counterparts for the spirals and the other ornaments in order to avoid putting too much pressure on the workstation. So thank you for watching, stay tuned and see you soon.